Okay, here we go. Welcome, welcome. So um, the the other folks on our screen are our friends from South Africa, Marlies Richter and Ishtar. Um, why don't you guys, um, well, you're, it's summer for you, right? Yeah, it's winter for us. It's yeah. terrible up here. Why aren't we in South Africa? <laughs> I don't know. So, so we know these two amazing activists because uh, a year ago, was it? Two years ago? Two years ago, we actually went down and worked with them um, doing a training workshop in Cape Town. And then Steve went back down a year later and worked with them on a more sort of intensive um, bunch of projects at the AIDS conference. Um, and so we're super happy you could be here. We're, it's, a, it's a very important time to be speaking to our South African comrades. Um, but we also realized that um, most people listening, or I'm gonna just, I'm gonna say myself, okay? I'm just gonna put it to myself, know very little about South African politics. It's like, there was apartheid, that was bad. Then there was the end of apartheid, that's good. And um, I think... And then Nelson Mandela, yay! <laughs> and probably it's a little bit more complicated. So for all of our viewers out there in webinar land, can you give us a little rundown on South African politics? You want to start? You go. Okay, so yes, we did have apartheid, and yes, that was bad. Um, <laughs> and then it ended, which was good. Uh, and we have a lot of people who were part of the struggle to uh, get rid of apartheid. They became politicians. And so a lot of them are now politicians in our parliament. And now what we're dealing with is a very complex situation of now how to deal with the repercussions of apartheid. Because you don't just take away the laws and say, okay, now everyone is equal. And then Voila, because entire cities were designed around apartheid mm -hmm. segregation, uh, entire transport systems, entire kind of legislative everything was designed around apartheid. So we're, we're now in a situation where we're trying to dismantle the repercussions of apartheid, so we still have deep inequality, um, but we also have democracy, which is pretty cool. Um, but then we also have the people that helped us take apart apartheid, now doing kind of really oppressive and kind of tyrannical things that they fought against. Um, so, yes, it's a bit complicated. Why is that? Like, it seems like it would be good to have your, the people that were on the right side in those battles in power now. Like, that was Nelson Mandela, right? So, how, how does that work? Um, I think people who were advocates and activists around um, Mandela's generation, many of them are quite old now, um, and some of their, their children and some of their uh, grandchildren are in the political terrain. Um, and I also think that in, in South Africa, because there were such dire inequalities in, under apartheid, and um, that there was such a pronounced difference between middle class and working class people, and under apartheid it was white middle class people um, drawing the benefit from from black working class or unemployed people. Um, many people who've now reached into the middle classes, um, whatever race they are, are drawing the benefits from that from that unequal structure, and that there is perhaps less. Um, less revolutionary energy to try and dismantle the unequal structures and the the, the structural violence that are built into the, the legislation and the um, yeah and the structures that we work under and that it suits people to to have those inequalities persist because often it is about personal enrichment. Well, um, it seems like we come from very different countries with very different political systems. Um, but we recently had a bit of a switch um, in this country. Um, you may have heard of our, 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 our new president, Donald Trump. Um, and one of the challenges for artists and activists in this country is how to respond to this new political terrain. Um, and to kind of help you out a little bit, we thought what we'd want to do is ask some of the people out in webinar land 
if you were to describe Donald Trump in one word, what would that word be? So just if you look over to your right at the chat box, just throw up a word which describes Donald Trump to you. This is going to help you out to understand what we might be facing here. Yeah. So here, oh, uh, what, we've got one here. Infantile. Yeah, so we got yeah. infantile from Margaret. Who, uh, Madam President. Yeah. Mugabe, <laughs> we, got, we got from Brenda. Um, cruel. Cruel. From Amanda. Um, Narcissistic, we got from Steve. Yeah. Carnival Barker. <laughs> Utterly yeah. unqualified. That's two words, but uh, yeah. good enough. Wannabe dictator. That's actually three words, but they made it into two. Um, insane. Yeah. Carnival? Uh, wannabe dictator. Oh, and then oh, one Carnival Barker. Yes. Carnival Barker. Yeah. Uh, playground right. bully. Um, <laughs> tyrants. Um, Rules were meant to be broken. Yeah, so the more than one word. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, okay, broken okay. rules. We've got a uh, large chicken. <laughs> imposter. Uh, an imposter. Okay, so these are good. So you're getting an idea. Selfish. Selfish. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you're getting an idea of who President Trump is. And it's not to say that we haven't had politicians we haven't disagreed with before. We certainly have. But it seems to be there's a qualitative difference between this government and previous governments. And we wanted to reach out to our comrades around the world um, who probably have a little bit more experience with dealing with leaders like this, dealing with a political situation like this. So did any of those words resonate with you? You're a politician? Many, many of them, <laughs> almost all of them. <laughs> OK, so we need what some help. What's that? The one about the chicken I didn't quite get. Oh, we're not sure we get it either. Well, <laughs> here you say, like, someone who's, like, cowardly, would, you would call them a chicken. Ah, yes. Oh, I okay, think that's okay. what we're Exactly. Um, so help us out here. Like, um, your present leader, President Zuma, for example, you've described him as a misogynist, interested in his own self-enrichment, um, a rapist, uh, corrupt, and kind of a baby, right? And so that going over his What do you? How do you work within that environment in which this your your the appeal to government and the appeal to the state? And it's a state you cannot almost recognize as sort of a rational, reasonable state, which you know how to play against. I mean, that's tough. I mean, we we have to kind of. There's many. We're fighting this battle on so many fronts. Um, and there's so many of issues of inequality and social justice that we have to now t take apart this leadership. Um, and for us, I mean, it's not only the president that is the problem. So there's a lot of people who have kind of isolated Zuma as being the problem. But the problem is it's not only him. If, um, if Zuma resigned or, I don't know, ran away to his own private island, um, the person taking his place, I don't think is going to be much better. It's the institution itself that is now quite corrupt. Um, and so there is a difficulty in trying to shift shift what seems immovable. Um, and so, I mean, we all try and do it in our various, our various issues and try and find the weak points and try and find um, the, soft, the soft targets and... Oh, I, I love and hate the term, but the low-hanging fruit. So where where it is that you can actually make make inroads, um, especially having a president that is very um, inaccessible, and when is challenged, his immediate defense is actually just to shut down spaces. So not not even to fight back, but just to shut down the spaces completely. Um, so some of the examples from the um, oh, there we go. Yes, so. That, that, that is something that we see quite often. Uh, he, it's under the guise of him adjusting his glasses. So he tends to talk, and when he's challenged, he, he takes that strategic moment to adjust his glasses by doing, by doing that. Um, and so, so he doesn't think, handle criticism well? I beg your pardon? He doesn't, handle, he doesn't handle criticism well? I mean, he even went through a stage where he stopped showing up at Parliament because people were criticizing him too much. So he was just like, 
I'm not going to come to Parliament then. Yeah. Um, I think I had a couple of thoughts while, while Ishtar was speaking, because I think she describes the situation very well, where there's a lot of a lot of criticism of the president, and rightly so, because mm. he is he is such a, a compromised person, um, and the and he symbolises the, the the ruling party at the moment. And I think what activists have tried to do is to try and get the members of parliament and supporters of of Zuma to speak out. Um, against his corruption and to break ranks with the people um, that they are in unity with because they basically prop up his um, his corruption and his misguided decisions and that's a structure that can only hold for that long and I think there's activists that have tried in, in overt and also in, in diplomatic ways to try and and break apart some of his support bases what I think has been has been heartening is the fact that whenever whenever Zuma does something outrageous, which is is quite often, um, which I think is probably what you experience in the states as well with with Donald Trump, civil society doesn't just accept it as it being another act of um, of being a loony or being misguided. There's always outrage that goes with it. So mm. civil society doesn't keep quiet and just say it doesn't help to to put out a press release or it doesn't help to um, register a complaint in parliament. There's constantly a resistance to to some of the um, some of the really um, unwise and deeply pro problematic um, speeches that he makes, the type of decisions that he makes, the, the type of laws and and state structures and the collapse they are that he's responsible for. And civil society doesn't just accept that this is how things are, that they're constant, constantly a contestation. And that's why he's not in this photo that we have on the screen at the moment. It's quite an unusual photo because he doesn't come to parliament anymore because he gets so much so much criticism. So that's in a in a way he is withdrawn from society um, and is buffered from um, that's and is buffered from some of the some of the criticism and the I think the suffering of, of people. And uh, advocacy point that I've just actually thought of while we were talking and I was thinking I should have we should have submitted a photo on that was Last last year, towards the end of last year, he it was at the we had local government elections, and it was one of the key moments where he made a public appearance, and he would um, he addressed the public in a in a in a public space, and there were lots of media cameras on him because it was the election, and there were four very brave activists who, on very hand drawn, it was like A4 pieces of paper with pens, like normal pens, wrote just a couple of words that talked about gender-based violence, about rape, um, about the, the name crazy of the of the woman that Zuma had allegedly raped. And they just stood in front of him. Um, and Ishtar is now going to send a link to, um, to some of these photos. Four women standing in front of the podium and saying things like, remember crazy. And the media picked this up and just ran with it. So it was a very simple, one of the most simple forms of resistance and activism that I've seen that has had an incredible impact. So people stay vigilant, they stay enthusiastic and engaged, and they seek out opportunities of weakness. And then with the media's help, because the media is also very hungry for for ways of, of um, showing this weakness or, or criticize or amplifying some of the, the criticisms um, that he's subjected to and then really getting the help from there. So can you just, you mentioned the, this alleged rape. Um, can you just, I think most people here would be unfamiliar with that. Um, would you mind just kind of giving the background on it a bit? Okay, so um, at the time, I'm trying to think. Jacob Zuma was actually not the president of the ANC. He was actually the deputy president of the ANC. And a fellow HIV activist um, 
came to us and said, I, I've, I've been raped by Jacob Zuma, I don't know what to do. Uh, and she reported it and she, she felt as an activist, as someone who does this for a living and asks people to speak out on a daily basis, it was her responsibility to, to follow through and um, go to court. Um, and thus ensued the Jacob Zuma rape trial, which was an incredibly traumatic experience. Um, one because, but yeah? He was president at the time. He was the deputy president of the ANC. So he wasn't oh, okay. yet the president of the ANC. But he was still an incredibly, incredibly powerful man and very well respected um, politically. And the, the rape trial itself was an absolute shambles. It was a complete circus. Um, people came out in huge amounts in support for Jacob Zuma and against Fazeka. Um, and um, I mean, we were on the front lines, a handful of activists, and we were being told things like, um, from the ANC Women's League, so the ruling party has a Women's League, and members of the Women's League were telling us, she was lucky to be raped by, by, by Zuma. I wish I was raped by Zuma. Um, wow. And so the case itself, I mean, you can find the judgment online. It's incredibly uh, problematic. So he was acquitted by the courts, uh, which was, I think, a very bad judgment. Um, the, the victim in all this, the survivor, was dragged through court processes in a very brutal way where her sexual history was brought brought like as part of evidence, her diary was put on the stand as part of evidence. I mean, it was all, it was all a huge mess. And the fact that he came out of that with even more support uh, than he that 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 he went into. So, and it was a very few brave handful of activists who were like, we know he's a powerful man. We know he has connections, but we're not we're not going to be silent about this. We can't we can't let one of our sisters speak out and not be there for her. Um, and so things like, so we, we had colleagues whose phones were tapped. Uh, we had house break-ins happen where computers were stolen. Um, and so it was a very, a very scary time in um, specifically like gender-based violence activism in this country. But you were, you, you too, I, I guess, were kind of among those people that were trying to counteract this, right? And so could you talk about... No, not at all. I, I was one no. of many, one of one of a bunch of brave activists that were that were there. Of course. Can you talk a little bit about things that you did that worked and things that you did that in, didn't work? Okay. I mean, for me, some of the things that really worked and some of the takeaways that I took away from those days that still work today are things like. Um, Always, always, you can take advantage of the confusion. So, for example, in South Africa, if you're going to do any kind of protest or any kind of picket that has more than 16 people, you have to apply for permission. So, there's something called the Gatherings Act, and in order to gather to for any purpose, you have to ask permission of the city, and then get marshals, and then the police, and then it's a whole, it's a whole. Rigmarole. I, I quite pride myself in the fact that I've been doing this for a while and I've never once filled in one of those forms. So we don't ask for permission. We protest without permission. And so, yes, it does put people in danger, um, but there's ways to mitigate against it. So one of the things we used to do quite often is we used to have protests at the Johannesburg High Court. Um, I sent some pictures with the guilty, not guilty wall and the cutouts of the woman. And all the time, because it's a high court, security is is heightened. So we often have uh, had police officers come to us and court officials go, what's going on here? Do you have permission? Uh, this was a wall we put up to show that um, the amount of uh, prosecutions you actually have with regards to rape in this country. So of all those rapes that have occurred, and it was a whole wall all the way down, that's the South Carteng High Court, um, only two of that would be guilty. Um, and so police officers would come to us going, do you have permission to do this? What's going on? And then we would take advantage of the confusion and the disorganization and say, yeah, yeah no, no, we do have permission. Um, the organizer is over there. I'm not quite sure what her name is, but, 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 but she has it. And then, and then the police officer will go up to another person and be like, no, but what's going on here? No, no, there is, there is an organizer. I promise you we have 
we have the right paperwork. I think she's just gone to the office to go to go get someone, and no one will claim leadership of the act. And we like very short, impactful things. So you go in two hours maximum, you're out of there. So by the time any of the officials have realized that there's actually no permission for this gathering, you're already out of there and gone. Um, so that was definitely one of the things we that 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 really worked. Um, one of the things that didn't work, I, I um, sent you a picture of a banner, a giant banner that we painted. Uh, we did it. We broke into um, that one. Yeah, we it was the it was in the anniversary of the Jacob Zuma rape trial, saying four years later Zuma is president, Kwesi is in exile because she had to go into exile. Um, because she was being um, harassed. Um, where is the justice? And this is a building we broke into opposite the high court. And we dropped this banner. And at the time, we thought we were so radical. We thought, oh, oh we're saying this really controversial stuff. Look at us. We're, we're essentially calling our president a rapist. We are, we are so radical. No one cared about that banner. Like, we thought mm -hmm. the police would come and tear it down. That banner was up for like, two weeks and it was like fluttering until it kind of flew off and that for us was a lesson that sometimes you, you think you're radical but you you actually might not be. They might not actually care that you you did this banner and in fact you don't get what you want out of it because you wanted the attention and you just didn't get it because you're not that radical. Why do you think it didn't work though? Like in hindsight, what do you think? I I am not entire, entirely sure. So I give yeah. a different interpretation. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm sharing Ishtar's <laughs> pessimism about the banner because I think the banner was pretty awesome. If you think of the geography of of Johannesburg, of where that the High Court is, there, it's in the the Johannesburg Central Business District. It's old colonial buildings. Um, and that was a very auspicious building, what I could see mm. from, it's where all the advocates um, have their chambers. And I know Ishtar worked very hard on that banner. So that was actually one of the things that I wanted to note in terms of the lessons, um, the lessons learned and some of the things that, um, that were useful in terms of advocacy. I didn't know Ishtar that well at that point. But I knew of this, this campaign in support of the, the rape survivor um, of the trial, and I knew that the activists were doing really transgressive things, and it was a small group of mostly women, not so small at the end because yes. they had so much mainstream um, support that all the all the Jacob Zuma supporters who were very conservative um, and quite aggressive, who would tell you um, you would have people from uh, people with sort of witch doctor clothes on who would throw spells on you when you were in front of the court. So using cultural symbols, using um, using a, a range of intimidation tactics of trying to push people away from support for a fair trial and support of the rape survivor. And that was catalyzed by this group that, that Ishtar and others, but I would like to emphasize the fact that Ishtar worked really hard at it because I know that there was sleepless nights and having to do perhaps the banner alone because no one had any more energy left. Um, so there's a note there about having to work hard and work your fingers to the bone. I think the banner that was up there for two weeks doesn't say that it didn't have an impact. I'm wondering how many of the thousands of people who walked past there, the advocates in their chambers, many of whose windows were perhaps obstructed by the banner, didn't want to take the banner down because they were in agreement of it. So oh, I'm okay. thinking that's perhaps a success Thank story. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, that's, if that's that circles funny. back, oh, that circles back to a point you made earlier, Ishtar, which is about sort of separating some of the people in the government from the leader of the government and seeing that as part of the weak point when you have a figure who actually seems to thrive off of dissent or doesn't care about dissent, that there are other figures in the government which actually can be used. We Now in this country we t like to talk a lot about the deep state, um, which is the sort of level of the state of people like judges and lawyers and policy folks who basically run things and may not be in agreement with 
the president and to actually work with them and on them and so on. I mean, so, I think, yes, sir. Karen? I was going to say, you, there's a lot we could talk about, and you sent some other images. Um, do you mind if I just pop some of these up and you can tell us about, about what, what these are and what you did and how they worked or didn't work? Do you see that one? Yeah, so, so that, that was what we did in the case after the Jacob Zuma rape trial, the next case that we worked on. It was a case that went on for years. Uh, it was a gang rape case, and there were just postponement after postponement after postponement. And so what we decided to do was to track these postponements. So every time there was a court appearance, we would make one of these cutouts of what date was the appearance and what was the issue and why it was postponed. Because what was coming out more and more is that the postponements had nothing to do with the survivor. It all had to do with the state's incompetence. And so we wanted to illustrate that visually. So we did this outside the high court, but every single time there was an appearance. So what started out with like 10 cutouts, by the end of the case, it stretched all along the whole length of, of the high court. Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly visually impactful because people had to walk along the high court. It's a very, it's a very busy road, and people have to walk along it to catch public transport. And and so they would start reading and go, "What is going on?" And by the end of it, we would be at the end of it, and then they would in, engage with us. And so that caused a lot of public pressure for this trial to be to be moved along swiftly. And of course, every time we we did, I think they possibly got sick of us not asking for permission. So I think by the end of it, they just let us do what we wanted to do. <laughs> and then you told me this story, or actually, let's talk about this. And then I want to go into the Lady Justice story. But what's uh, so this um, part of the silent protest that was started at Rhodes University. So it's where students and uh, students speak to the fact that sexual violence equals silence. So on one day of the year, all people's mouths, women women's specifically, their mouths get taped uh, and they get a t-shirt that says sexual violence equals silence and an explanation on the back with a, with a pamphlet. And they, are, they wear that all day. Uh, they don't eat, they don't drink, they go to uh, lectures, and they sit in lectures. The only people who don't have tape over their mouths are people that want to come forward as rape survivors. Um, mm. But everyone else, including men, are in solidarity with the woman. Um, and so this was a very powerful campaign in Grahamstown uh, that grew and grew and grew. But it also is possibly a lesson in repetition and how you can't do the same thing over and over and over again. It reaches a point where it is effective, and then it reaches a point where it stops being as effective. So in the first year it was done, it was, lecturers didn't know what to do because they had entire classes where 90% of their students had their mouths taped. Um, so it was very effective in the beginning, but I think as it went on and grew, I think people got desensitized to it. Mm. Um, okay, so tell us about this. Oh, that was fun. Uh, that was also um, outside the court in, uh, this was part of the Bui Siwe case as well. Uh, we wanted again to illustrate how many times the state has actually been incompetent and that's the reason why these cases don't go forward. Uh, so we made a kind of lady justice toga which was bloodied and you see at the bottom of that toga you see all the kinds of things that go wrong with rape trials specifically. So DNA samples going wrong, uh, dockets going missing. Um, and then we snuck that, that's an incre incredible performance artist and, um, and Tokazani. Um, she, uh, we, we snuck in this ensemble into the court and she did a performance piece inside the court where she essentially was dying Lady Justice. And she was begging advocates, people in the court to please, please help her. Um, and then with a dramatic death scene on the steps of the court. And that is still a very powerful picture and still a picture that I think encapsulates kind of that era of activism in South Africa. And it was an incredibly powerful performance. And 
for me, what is more important is not not about raising awareness and not about people knowing about the case, but what actually did did we get what we wanted out of it, which was we wanted a speedier trial, we wanted no more delays, and we got that. So for me, a successful action actually speaks to something happening. Um, for me, especially when it comes to these kind of cases. Raising awareness is not enough. So what if people know that this horrible thing is happening? That, that that doesn't help us to do what we need to do. It's, oh, this horrible thing is happening. Here, I am going to do this. Um, so in that regard, that action was very was very successful because the next date, um, we actually got a far more reasonable date for the case because they wanted to postpone it, I think, by two months. Amazing. Wow. So. We need a little help. This is incredibly inspiring. But we have a liar in the White House. We have a White House which seems to pride itself on what they call alternative facts. And so much of activism is really based on sort of truth telling. You know, this is the truth about what's happening, you know, and once we actually see the truth, then hopefully things will change. And we've never been, we've always debated about what the truth is about, but we've never had someone who just makes stuff up, right? But you have great experience in having ministers and a former president, I believe, and Marlise, you told us the story earlier, about someone who just made stuff up. Um, so why don't you tell the story about the former president, um, but also, how do you respond to that? Yeah. I think there's, there's some great parallels with what we had as our, our second democratic president. So in 1994, we had Nelson Mandela, who was our, our awesome president. And perhaps you can show the photo there of, of Madiba with her HIV-positive T-shirt on. He's standing next to Zaki Ahmed, who um, is the leader for, or was the leader of the Treatment Action Campaign, a very outspoken activist group on getting HIV, AIDS treatment um, to people with HIV. So Nelson Mandela's legacy, I think, is in quite stark contrast with he, with Tabu Mbeki, who was the person who followed him up um, as president. And Tabu Mbeki had some really, really problematic and very terrifying views on science and. Uh, specifically about HIV and how HIV and AIDS are linked. So in around 2000 and 2001, he became, he became quite vocal about the fact that he didn't believe that HIV caused AIDS. And he, in fact, he put together a panel um, of, of people to discuss the, the origins of, of AIDS. And half of the panel included AIDS denialists, and the other half were hardcore scientists, so professors, virologists, people who've been working in the fields of HIV, who's always just taken for granted the fact that you can you can show by Koch's postulates and all the scientific tests that have been, um, been tested that HIV is a virus and it causes AIDS. And they then had to be in the same room with compute, complete loony bins who would say, but it's actually not, there's no such thing as a virus. Um, and just the absolute shock and disbelief that there could be such differing interpretations of what was an illness that was at that point killing 500 people a day. So it wasn't a theoretical debate about ideology or philosophy, it was something that was killing off 500 South Africans a day. Um, and Part of, of Tobin Becky's AIDS denialism included a Minister of Health called Mantu Tabalala Misimang, who had the yeah. same the same views as, as Tabu Mbeki. And she was responsible for resisting at that point, you would remember in the early two thousands, there's a, a very uh, a very useful um, cartoon of her where her views on, on HIV and the type of fiction and outlandish views on, on HIV, I think is quite well depicted. Um, she, her department, Department of Health, um, was supposed to make antiretrovirals that were being rolled out in other countries and were showing how, um, how it was averting mortality 
and how people were living long lives, she was resisting that. And not only was she resisting the fact that um, antiretrovirals could be bought quite cheaply through generic substitutions and parallel importation, she was saying that one needed to look at things like garlic, um, lemon, sweet potato, sweet potato um, and that you should just stick with those natural remedies and that that would help you to live long lives. And I think one of the, the most embarrassing moments was when we were at an international AIDS conference, I think it was in Barcelona in 2001, and the Department of Health stalls at AIDS conferences, there's always this big village and lots of different countries and groups and um, activists um, have a village together where they have different stalls and you can have discussions with people. The South African government and Department of Health stall had reams of garlic and potatoes and sweet potatoes and lemons hanging from its stall. And it's in the middle of a scientific conference. So it was for activists really hard to be dealing with the fact that their comrades were dying. Um, and it was literally uh, an experience of working with people, taking their affidavits. I was at that point working in a, in a law organization that was um, was supporting the treatment action campaign, taking people's affidavits about um, how they're battling with HIV, and then within a week or two, those people were dead. So the the urgency of having to refute and bring down the views of of people that we now know, and we can see, I think there's recently been a study that that showed that with modeling that. Tob and Becky's AIDS denialism had caused the death of 330,000 people. If he didn't have so much power and he didn't push AIDS denialism as as hard as he did, 330,000 people would have been alive today because they would have had treatment. So activists, I think, were very, very much pushed by this this higher rate of mortality and the dream of bringing um, treatment to South Africa, and that led. To a lot of a lot of protest and eventually to civil disobedience campaigns um, to push government to realize um, that this is something that they need to put attention to and we eventually had a, a court battle that we won um, in 2003 where our courts came out strongly in terms of scientific facts that they reaffirmed the importance of ARVs and they made it a government policy or they pushed government very hard to make it a policy that we um, that that ARV should be available, and that was partly because of the push by activists highlighting the the chasm between these fantasies of AIDS denialism and the reality of people dying without treatment. And I think that narrative and that um, those images that were created through advocacy. Was and the pressure in court, of course, um, about people being in court with HIV-positive T-shirts on, created the visual spectacle for judges to do the right thing, and it was a unanimous judgment. Um, and I think that was part of resisting that that narrative through collective action. So that's interesting because it sounds like what you learned was you don't necessarily face the fact deniers with here's the report and this is what the facts are, but instead by showing the human consequences of their denial. Yeah, and I think campaigns, campaigns were personalized by being led by people with HIV and would also use very specific individuals. The uh, 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 court case would quote a person, the first name of the person as the first um, applicant in the court case, and you would then push that story of the the person of their daily um, their daily challenges with HIV, and you would put it sounds mundane, but you would put an, a face to HIV, and instead of just saying that there is no such thing as HIV or HIV doesn't cause AIDS, you have people who are who are the face of it, and that shows. But you can't be making these statements. It has very, very dire consequences. I'm reminded of a couple of things. One is that our vice president, Mike Pence, um, 
would not do needle exchanges in his state of Indiana. And there were literally people that died in the period where he was deciding whether or not he should uh, begin doing these needle exchanges. Like, or not people dying, people uh, uh, getting HIV because they were using dirty needles. And there's a number of people that acquired HIV in that period where he couldn't make up his mind. Um, and it, it's such, it's the heartbreaking thing is the consequence, right? And like that, that the consequence has to be so great and that, that that's what, you know, ended up leveraging it is like bringing these people that are actually affected. But to know that that's what it takes is helpful. Um, the other thing is I'm reminded of uh, last summer at the AIDS conference, the project that we worked on together, which was that we were trying to um, highlight people that had actually were already dead. And, and have their presence at the AIDS conference. And Ishtar, maybe, or either of you could talk about this and, and what you've done with it since. So. And actually, yes. really quick. Yes. Uh, while you're telling that story, if anybody has questions, you can start typing in the questions and then we'll relay those to Marlies and Ishtar. Okay, this is, this is a campaign we all worked on together where we launched a campaign called Say Her Name, kind of inspired by the Say Her Name campaign in the States, uh, looking at specifically sex workers who have died. Because um, currently in South Africa, sex work is criminalized, so buying, selling, all of it criminalized, even though we know the facts say that the best way for sex workers to access rights, access justice, access healthcare, lower HIV transmission, all these things, all point to decriminalization of sex work, this is a wonderful fact. This is a fact that policymakers are not listening to at the moment. Um, so we wanted to kind of show the harms, the actual harms of criminalization. So sex workers are killed daily in South Africa, but a lot of it is gone unreported. Um, unreported because of, there is a lot of stigma and discrimination against sex workers. So often the newspaper reports would read, uh, woman's body, dead, dead prostitute found, or they would give no story, no kind of saying who this person was, and we find this incredibly depressing and disrespectful. So we launched a campaign called Say Her Name, um, where we, cases that are reported to us, we follow it up, we kind of put a face to what criminalization is doing for sex workers. And so this, um, this particular picket uh, we had directly outside uh, a talk that was being uh, one of the keynote speakers there were our Deputy Minister of Justice, John Jeffries. Uh, he was speaking at this and he was speaking about decrim in South Africa and sex work and I think the topic was even about whether South Africa is serious about dressing the, the rights of sex workers and um, so he came out to, to face this, to face the reality of what is what South Africa actually is doing to sex workers, and this has grown exponentially. I mean, for us, this is a very big week for us in South Africa. Yesterday, uh, I don't think her her poster isn't there, but there is a poster of Nokopila Kamalo, who was beaten to death um, four years ago in South Africa, and a very famous internationally known artist, South African artist, Valetu Mteto, was accused of her murder. And yesterday we were in court for the judgment and he was found guilty, which is very big for us. But we, um, so we did this outside the court as well yesterday. Um, and we keep on bolding, bolding the names, bolding the stories and continuing to say her name. Uh, because if we don't, no one else will. But I think the presence that we had at the court and putting perpetual pressure, um, I think assisted with the guilty judgment. I feel people behave a lot better when they feel that they're being watched, um, including judges, including prosecutors, including investigative officers, including politicians. If they think they're being watched, they will behave a lot better and are more likely to do the right thing than if we just kind of let the court case go on for four years unmonitored. Fantastic. Um, so we have some questions uh, from folks that I want to relay to you. Um, can, and if you have questions, please enter them in now. We want to uh, like to be able to ask Ishtar and release everything that you want to know. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's start with this one. One was, uh, are you using 
social media for pop-up protests or other net-based campaigns? Like, how, are you using online tools? Does that work down there? And how do you use them? Which one? <laughs> You're both so huh? humble. Oh, yes. Yes. No, so, so we, we do use social media. Me, myself, I am a Luddite. Uh, I will admit that. It was up to me. People would only communicate with me through written correspondence, handwritten correspondence. Um, but we have smarter people than I that do social media things um, and mobilize on social media. And it is, it is very big here. So Twitter, Facebook uh, is a really good tool. Um, I have an idea. We haven't done it yet, though, but we're going to do it where we want, uh, around Workers' Day, we want uh, as many people as possible to change their occupation on Facebook to sex worker, um, mm. to see how many people would actually do that. Um, but, I mean, what we find a lot is, especially what, what I came to realize with this, um, with the Mtetwa trial, is that uh, people show a lot of online solidarity, but then sometimes when you ask actual bodies to manifest themselves at a place because we need your body there, uh, they're, they're not there so much. Um, so we do have a lot of online activism, but sometimes um, what I was saying about creating awareness not being enough, um, a lot of the, the things that we're trying to change a lot of the time actually need bodies in spaces. And so we find it's very hard for social media to do that thing of getting bodies like physically at a space. Yeah. Um, is it okay if I go on to another question? Okay. So um, we have a, our, our first female president, Margaret McCarthy. She's a, you might not have heard of her yet, but she is the first female president of the United States. You can look it up online. Um, anyway, Margaret wants, President McCarthy wants to know um, about pacing yourself and maintaining your center when these problems are so vast and varied. It seems like a really long horizon for major change. So how do you, how do you uh, pace yourself? I think in what I've learned through sex work activism, um, particularly because it is such a hard form of activism um, because there is so much stigma that attaches to sex work where people who would consider themselves progressive, um, who would believe in human rights, who would believe in dignity, that even among friends or people that you would see as allies would still hold very conservative and very moralistic views about the rights of sex workers. Um, so in many ways, in some of the, the social justice issues that I've worked in, sex work is the harder one because there is such resistance from so many walks of life and from so many um, institutions. So the thing that I've learned from, from the, the, the thing that I've learned specifically from sex work activism is how yeah, how daunting it is that you think you have to change people's minds and people's minds of people you might feel are quite close to you or who you thought would would have the same views as you. And the the realization for me was the fact that you can do small things. You can you can have people think a little bit. If you have people think about sex work, you should already see that as a victory because there is so much capital and um, so much uh, emotional work that goes on in society to make sex workers disappear. So even if you just have people think about sex work, if you post something on Facebook, if in a dinner conversation you use the word sex work or if someone uses the word prostitute in South Africa, um, we use the word sex worker that's much more respectful. If you challenge someone's vocabulary or their terminology, or you note um, something about a victory in a case about sex workers, you are already challenging a lot of the a lot of the the beliefs that people hold, and that you just have to persist in that. And having a group of people, like having Ishtar, having an organisation, having a core group of activists who go on despite the odds, despite that people are being killed in brutal ways, the fact that there's often a crisis, the fact that people stick together and look after, um, look after the, the activists and their comrades, I think 
means that it's that we can go so much further um, and do 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 impactful things because it comes from a, a safe and nurturing space. I think. Um, I, Ishtar, if you, if you have any thoughts on that, um, go ahead. Otherwise, I can ask you another question. No, I like that. No, nurturing, nurturing space. I like, and for me, it's also about having kind of the short game and the long game, and having that in mind. And so, for example, what I really love about the work that Sweat does is that a certain element of it is service provision, direct service provision. Because sometimes, when you're fighting for decrim or for law to change, which is going to take forever, when you're fighting to kind of smash the patriarchy, which might not happen in my lifetime, it might not happen in young people's lifetime. It's kind of it's kind of depressing, really. So. If there are, and I know it's 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 a it's a it's a little bit of a selfish thing, but if there is a way that I can actually help someone on a daily basis, where I can get kind of instant gratification to fuel myself to go, okay, I have that long game, and I'm going to carry on doing the long game, but at least these are the ways that I can kind of keep myself going to kind of ensure that generations after me smash the patriarchy. You know, one thing I, I want to <laughs> point out, at having worked with you guys in South Africa and coming from the United States, is that the way that a, a protest happens is so different than it is here. That it is um, it is like enlivening, and there's like part of a spirit giving um, aspect to every, even the most basic like march, right? That it that you cannot stop when a group of people from Sweat or Sasanke get together, like, there's no way you can stop them from singing. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, they're going to sing. And so, like, and dance. And, you know, like, that. that's, that's always a part of the way that they do things. And, and that there's a vitality in the Sweat office. Where as soon as you walk in, there's, like, an energy that, that provides instead of drains. And that that's something that is like a bigger, deeper thing that I think we can learn in the U.S. It's, I, it's just like fundamental, you know. And if you, uh, go, so if you think... go to our Facebook page, uh, Liseko is our media officer, who's the one who actually knows how to do things on the interwebs. Uh, she actually posted a video from outside the court yesterday when we heard the judgment and that describes everything. Everything you were saying about the kind of vitality and the singing and the dancing that we're all about. And we'll include that link. For so sure. we're gonna go right up to one o'clock because I think there's so much good stuff that you can tell us, and we have really good questions. Um, but that only <laughs> that means five more minutes. Um, and uh, Rebecca is going to start pasting in links of uh, your organization, Sweat and Asajiki and Sanke and Sasanke. Um, but uh, and so people can learn more. But let's go. Let's see. Uh, this is a good question um, from Kinsley. How much pre-planning goes into your actions, or are, are and are any of them spontaneous, or how do you generally work? So I think. Often a misnomer with advocacy is that it's just something that happens spontaneous and people just come and it works like a bomb. Um, and I think one thing that I've learned, especially through working with, with the two of you, Steve, is the amount of work that needs to go into um, catalyzing creativity and planning events. So, of course, if there's a, in South Africa, it's there's xenophobic outbreaks where people get attacked for being foreigners. And you can't, you have to have a march in the next day. So you have to have a lot of emergency plans in place, like mundane things like having water for protesters or having jackets for people who are marshals or a loud hailer. Those are things that you can plan for if you are, if you are a professional organizer or you work in an organization that does advocacy. But some of the, the longer term things where you have an event so where we all worked together on the AIDS conference last year, you actually have to plan very far ahead and you have to make sure that some of your actions, especially if it's actions that you want to have a large platform for or that you want to be, um, you want to have um, 
have to, to catch people by surprise and have it unusual. You have to plan for that and you have to have a lot of brains in the room. You have to have some conditions in place that help people think creatively. And then you have to make it work. And that's the hard slogging of getting people to build things, to paint things, to go to hardware stores and buy things that um, perhaps feels the opposite to spontaneity, but is not, it's, it's part of that process. So I think we've had a lot of spontaneous act, activism happen, but I think the most of the things actually had to have a lot of, of thought and sweat and tears go into it to have the end product. And, and for me, it's about being radically responsible. Uh, so especially with sex work activism, you're asking people to come out and put their lives on the line for an action. So for me, as part of a person that's organizing stuff, you can't just put people at risk. So you have to make sure you have attorneys that are on call and lawyers that can do bail applications. And, and so you've got to be responsibly radical. Um, and I know that sounds a bit weird, but like, there will be people in your group that have more privilege than other people. There are people that the police might stop and search and other people that the police wouldn't stop and search. So put all the dodgy stuff with that person. Um, so in order for you to be effective, you also need to think of these things and use them to your advantage. Um, and to ensure that if, if you are asking people to go out on a limb and be in a situation that could possibly result in violence, they are fully consenting to what they're, what they're doing. Because uh, I think it's very irresponsible to kind of plan something where you know that it might result in violence and then have no support. Um, so that, be radically responsible. Yeah, on, the, on, the, on the twin note of planning for creativity and radical responsibility, um, we're going to have to say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. um, and it, it's, not, it's not goodbye. It's just farewell for now. Um, I think we should do this. We should do a follow-up with you guys. Yeah, we'll figure out how to Because there's like, we had so many more slides, and there's a, a lot so more questions, questions, and there's a lot of value here. So maybe we can, after this, we'll plan on doing a round two or something. Yeah, but in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah normally at... Normally, at the end of this, we ask people to donate because there are donations that we get from the sort of pay for the expenses of, of um, running the webinars. But um, I think what we're going to do, if there's a way, and Ishtar, you can tell us, is have people donate for this round to Sweat, um, partly because our powerful U.S. Okay, dollars will do. No, because we like these so much. You to carry on. Yeah. They, they, like, the, uh, unfortunately, the imbalance of our economies. <laughs> no, no, we're saying don't no, 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 to no, you. No, no. <laughs> um, Humility out the window. Let um, us be humble for a second. Yeah, that your your money, that your U.S. money goes a really long way in South Africa. Um, unfortunately for you, but our, but in this way we can make it work. So, is there a way that people can donate to to Sweat or Asajiki online? Is there? Yeah, I mean, well, well, what you can do is you can just email info at sweat, and then we can share whatever details if people need. So go okay. to the website, and then you'll see an info, and then we'll share all our bank details, and you can put your large amounts of dollars in it. Right. Yeah, and even like a donation of five dollars of five U.S. dollars, it translates to so much more there. Um, yes. Like. No, it's a our, our currency is not the strongest. <laughs> and now, what does SWEAT stand for? The Sex Worker Education and Advocacy Task Force. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you to everybody who is out there in webinar land. Um, we're going to go on a break for a little while, and we're going to return in April 7th, 7th with our friend from Hollywood. Um, who's going to talk about how we can learn from Hollywood to defeat an entertainment president. Yes. So, um, and you can register for that. Uh, we'll send out a link. We'll send out a video of this. <laughs> um, and um, thank you again, Marlies and Ishtar, for taking the time on your Friday night for you. Um, oh, you know, we could be out partying, hey? <laughs> you can party now. <laughs> <laughs>
but yeah, <laughs> exactly. and we'll, we'll have you back. So thanks again, and um, we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.